didn't matter as an individual. What mattered was the group. What mattered was the state. And the best thing that I could do was follow everybody else and do what everybody else did and live, live, fight for this group. And then I read this book. And the book is Atlas Shrugged by Iron Man. And I disagreed with the book from beginning to end. I fought with it. I argued with her. I yelled at the book. Didn't help much. Nobody yelled back at me. <laughs> because the book challenged everything I had been taught. It said, why? Why should you live for the group, for other people? Is it your life? important? Is it your life just as important as other people's lives? Is it your happiness as an individual, as a human being, just as important as the lives of other people? See, I'd always be taught, and I'm sure you were taught, and we're all taught, from when we were very young, that what's important is to put your interest last, to put the interest of other people first, that sacrifice is noble, that being selfless is noble. And this book, Alan Shrugged, says why? Why shouldn't you put your interest first? Why isn't it just as important that you achieve happiness, that you live the best life that you can live as other people? And of course, I had big arguments with this because it didn't fit, it didn't fit what I had been taught, it didn't fit what the culture taught me and what every, everything else around me taught me. But, you know, one of the, probably the most important thing in, in my view, in life, is uh, is ability to think for yourself and to challenge your own ideas and to, my job, as I see it in life, is to go around challenging people, getting people to think. You know who, uh, last person, uh, not the last person, but uh, in history, who did this and got into trouble? Yeah. What's that? Socrates. Socrates, yeah. Now, don't compare me to Socrates, because I'm no, nowhere near as smart as Socrates. He was a genius. Uh, but what, what, was, what, what did Socrates, what was the reward that Socrates got for challenging the youth? For corrupting young people, which is my job. What's that? He was killed. He was killed. How was he killed? He was basically voted to death, right? So the citizens of Athens got together and said, Oh my God, he's corrupting our young people. We've got to silence Socrates. We shouldn't let him speak. And how do you silence Socrates? What's the only way to silence Socrates? Kill him. It's to kill him. So they voted to kill him. Majority, 51%, whatever the majority was, probably 75%, voted to kill him, and they gave him a, a, a chalice of poison. And uh, Plato, the student, this story has it, I don't think this is true, but the story is a good story, says to, says to Socrates, I've got a tunnel. We can escape. You don't have to die. And what does Socrates say? No, no I believe in democracy. And he drinks the poison and dies. So uh, many lessons in that story. But I think Socrates is a great man to a large extent because he's willing to challenge people's preconceptions. And this book, this book of Atlas Shrugged, challenged everything I believe. And it really said, why not live for yourself? But what does that mean, to live for yourself? What do we, most of us, think? When we hear the idea of self-interest, or we hear the idea of, of living for yourself. What kind of behavior, when we, when we say to about somebody, he's self-interested, or even worse, he's selfish. What do we mean by that? <laughs> he only cares about himself. Well, what does that mean when you say only cares about himself? What's he going to do? Not care about others, which will lead him to? Loneliness. To what? Loneliness. L loneliness, absolutely. <laughs> but what kind of behavior towards other people is it going to lead him to have? 
selfish, but what does selfish mean? Betrayal. Betrayal. What's that? Making choices for your own brother. Yeah, but what, what, again, what kind of choices do we usually associate with thinking only about yourself and not caring about others? They're arrogant. Arrogant. You guys are gentle. What else? <laughs> yeah. Opportunistic. Opportunistic. Unsympathetic. Unsympathetic. You know, still evil things. Yeah, evil things, which means what? He's going to lie, cheat, and steal. He's going to walk on corpses. He's going to do whatever it takes, exploit other people. He's going to be a really nasty person. That's what we associate with being self-interested or being selfish. It's, it's really ugly, right? So when someone could find that a uh, selfish person would be bad because he goes against the he, he has wills that may be contrary to or uh, be prejudicial to the life of the Well, we can talk about presidential, uh, 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 presidential or go against, but I think most of us associate this idea of evil in our mind, which means that a selfish person is going to be somebody who acts against other people, who exploits other people, and will do anything to get his way. Anything. Right? That's what we associate. Now think about that. If you lie, steal, cheat, exploit other people, are you going to be happy? If you get what you want. If you get what you want. So, so let's say you get a lot of money. Let's say by stealing, cheating, you get a lot of money. Are you going to be happy? No. If you have like options, you have options. You have a sense of right or wrong, you might feel bad. So there's nothing existential in the world out there that's going to prevent you from being happy. If you get the money, yeah, it doesn't matter how you got it, you're going to be happy. So let me tell you a story. So there's this, uh, this true story. There's this guy in America, I don't know how many of you have heard of him because you're young, you're young. Uh, maybe, the, maybe your teachers have heard of him. A guy named Bernie Madoff. Anybody hear of Bernie Madoff? So Bernie Madoff was a finance guy, and he created the largest pyramid scheme ever. Pyramid scheme is where I take your money, I, I ask you to invest money with me, and I promise you, let's say, 20% return. Now I can't, I actually don't invest the money, I spend it. So how am I gonna pay you 20% return? I go to you, and I promise you 20% return, and you give me the money, and then I give it to you. But then what, how am I gonna pay you? I have to get a whole row over there of people to give me the money, and then I give, it, I give some of it to you. And then how do I pay you back? I have to get more people in the back. And he slowly build this thing, and he, he defrauded people out of 63 billion B dollars. The biggest pyramid scheme in history. One big fraud. And who did he go to to get the money? It had to be people he knew, because he was going to give him money. So it was his best friends. It was uh, his golf, his country club, the people he met at the country club. It was everybody he knew, right? And he managed to raise, because he had this great reputation, and he, he had great returns, right? He was making the same return every single year, and he made, and he got $63 billion. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's almost Bill Gates-like money. Was he happy? Why wasn't he happy? Why do you think he wouldn't be happy? He didn't have friends anymore. Didn't have friends anymore. Why? <laughs> now, now, why didn't he have friends anymore? He took their money. Well, but, but they thought they were investing with him. So they were happy. They were, his friends were happy because their money on paper seemed to be growing every year. It was getting bigger and bigger. So they didn't mind. They were still Friendly to his him. Yeah. I think it's because like you like you're going to jail and yeah, you're a criminal, so like I don't know. Yeah, we'll get to jail in a minute because you're right. <laughs> yeah, because he's lying to his friends. So imagine. And if you don't believe me, you can try this. Instead of pajama day, do lie to a friend day. And see how long they stay your friends. <laughs> and see how complicated and hard it is. So the reason he didn't have any friends, 
is because he couldn't look anybody in the eye. He was constantly lying to them. He constantly had to be protective of himself. He constantly was in stress. He knew he was lying. So even though he didn't have a sense of right or wrong, obviously he stole $63 billion. <laughs> he still couldn't have friendships. So he started losing all his friends. But it's not just his friends. His sons, his sons worked in the business. And his sons didn't know he was committing fraud. So he kept having to hide where he got the money and how he got the money. And his sons kept coming to him and said, Oh, we'd like to be in the family business. Where are you investing all this money? How do, how do we, we want to understand, you know, we're learning, we want to understand. And he said, oh, no, no, too complicated. You people, are, you sons are too stupid to understand how I do this. So he started losing his sons. And his wife was curious, how come they had so much money? And all his relationships started to fade away. And he became more and more lonely more and more afraid of what? Of being discovered, not by the police, but by his friends, by his family. And indeed what happened in the end is he wasn't caught by the police. In, 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 in America, the, 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 the police who regulate the financial industry are too busy following me to uh, people like me to catch actual crooks, right? And uh, so he was caught by his son. His son discovered he was committing fraud, called the police, and the police came and arrested him, and he's now in jail. His son, a year after he let the police know, committed suicide because he was so ashamed of what his father had done. This man's life completely was destroyed. And, and today in jail, he says, he's in jail for the rest of his life. He says he's happier in jail than he was before he got caught. Because life was so miserable, lying and cheating and stealing. And this is true of almost every crook. Lying, cheating and stealing are terrible strategies if you want to live a good life. If you really care about yourself, the last thing you want to do is lie, cheat, steal. So I, for example, I have a hard time, I have a hard time remembering what I did last week. It's just I'm getting old and I'm busy. And like you asked me, where were you, you in the world last week? And I go, uh, I can't remember. I think I was in Puerto Rico. I live in Puerto Rico. Imagine if I lied about what I did last week. And now I have to remember two things. I can't remember one. Now I have to remember two. But it's really not two things. I have to remember the truth and the lie. I have to remember who I told the truth to and who I told the lie to. I have to remember why I told these people the truth and those people the lie. Lying is just too complicated. It screws up your mind. So, I don't think that lying, cheating, stealing is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a strategy for being successful and being happy. I don't think people who lie, steal, cheat are ever happy. It's destructive. It actually does you harm. You lose friends, you lose spouses, you lose, if you lie in business, if you lie in business, nobody's going to deal with you. Nobody wants to have anything to do with you. And the same in life. Now, what is it, if you really cared about yourself, what do you think is the one thing that you would want? So we've talked about what you don't want. You don't want to lie, steal, and cheat. But what would you want? What is the positive? What's the thing that is really good for you as a human being if you want to live a happy life? Being honest. Being honest. Being honest is certainly necessary, I think, to a happy, successful life. And we'll talk about why in a minute. But something more fundamental than even being honest. What is the one thing that human beings have, one capacity that we have as human beings, that's unique to us, that makes all the values that we have, all the things that we 
you know, the building we're in, the fact that we have a school, everything. You know, your iPhone, possible. What is it that makes all these things possible? Money. Money, right? Money makes a lot of things possible. But where does money come from? Entrepreneurship. Something more fundamental even than entrepreneurs. What's that? Reason. Reason. That's good, but he's a teacher, he's cheating. <laughs> what is reason? What is reason? It's a nice word. No, because it's 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 knowing. But so reason is our ability to think. Reason is an ability to observe the world out there, integrate it, understand it, discover what is true and what is false, and therefore what is right and what is wrong. Integrate it into new knowledge. Everything that we have as human beings is a consequence of our reason, of our ability to think, of rationality, of our rational faculty. For example, where does food come from? Where? Animal. That's good. Last time I was in this school, I asked that question. Where does food come from? And you know what the answer was? Supermarket. The supermarket. <laughs> so, things, things have gotten better for the last two years. <laughs> food, where does food come from? You said where? Animals, where else? Agriculture. agriculture. Anybody here have the gene for agriculture? <laughs> You have a gene for agriculture? I don't even, yeah, that's, that's cool. <laughs> nobody has a gene for agriculture. <laughs> and the reason nobody has a gene for agriculture is for, you know, human beings, I don't know, being around for a million years and saying, for most of that period, we didn't have agriculture. How did we get agriculture? What did we eat before we had agriculture? We hunted and we ate berries and nuts. We picked stuff up from the ground, right? What's that? We, hunt, we also hunted. That was our yeah, so we hunted. Now, anybody here have the gene for hunting? <laughs> yeah, we got one hunter and one agriculturalist. <laughs> <laughs> if you look around the room, if you look around this room, I can guarantee you that none of you have the capacity or the gene for hunting. And the reason is, that if you look around the room, you can see what a pathetic animal we are. <laughs> we're weak, we're slow, we have no claws, we have no fangs. You try running down a buffalo and biting into it. <laughs> I mean, a cheetah has the genes for hunting. A lion has the genes for hunting. Human beings do not have the gene for hunting. But what do we have? Cool. We have tools, but where did they come from? Man from heaven? We have brains. We have knowledge. We have, knowledge. we have reason. So we have the capacity to invent, to create, to build things that don't exist. There are no tools in nature. We create tools in order to hunt. We develop strategy in order to hunt. We can communicate so we can hunt. All of those are tools of reason, of our rational faculty. We, you know, agriculture, some genius probably discovered about 20,000 years ago that if a seed drops to the ground and you water it and something grows, that there's a causal relationship between those things. He was the Einstein of his day. You guys all learned that in kindergarten. But he, somebody had to discover it. And we probably, what did we do with that person, probably? Yeah. Probably burnt him at the stake. Because that's what we like to do with people who really invent new things. We don't like them. <laughs> and then, and then we had to have some great entrepreneurs, somebody mentioned entrepreneurs, right? Who said, yeah, that's an interesting idea. I wonder if I can turn that into an industry called agriculture. But that's not obvious, there was no genes involved, that somebody had to figure it out. Everything we have, I don't know how many of you know how to make clothes, I don't know how to make clothes. I go and buy it at the store. But it's hard to make clothes, it's complicated. Somebody had to figure it out. 
everything that we have, all the products, all the material goods that we have in the world are products of human reason, the product of our rational faculty. As Aristotle said, we are the rational animal. We survive and thrive by using reason. Not by using muscle, but by using our mind. And our mind requires, requires that we look at facts, at truth. Because what happens if you put into, into this wonderful machine that we have up here, falsehoods? Does it work well? There's a term in computers, in computer science, called garbage in, garbage out. If you put nonsense in, you get nonsense out. If you put falsehood in, you get falsehood out. Our lives, our existence, and I would argue our happiness depends on having, using our reason, using our minds effectively, productively, with no garbage in so that it's pure. And that's why honesty, that you said, is so important. And who's the most important person to be honest to? Yourself. Yourself. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to leave religion for another time. The most important person to be honest to, if you value your mind, if you value reason, if you value your life, if you want to be happy, is you. Because you want to keep your consciousness, your reason, your rational faculty clean and effective without any garbage in it. And the same reason you don't want to <coughs> deceive and lie to other people. It's because it's important to you not to deal in falsehood, not to deal in lies. It's too damaging to your own capacity to think. So we have to think to be successful, to be happy, to be prosperous, to be self-interested in my view. The most important thing you can do is think. What else? What else do we have to do in order to survive as animals other than think? What do you have to then do with the thoughts? Communicate. Communicate is important, but even before you communicate, what's and, and part of the reason for communication is to be is to do what? Well, you need to interpret the thoughts of them. You need to act, yeah. right? You need to act. But what is the most important activity for us to, to be able to survive, to be able to provide for ourselves? We eat food and drink water. Eat food and drink water. That's right. <laughs> And how do we get food and water? Where does food and water come from? Somebody said, from the supermarket, that's right. And how do we get the food and water from the supermarket? You have to hunt the animals or? You buy it. What's that? You buy it, you have to have money, right? So one way or another, you either have to go and raise the food and water yourself or get the food and water yourself, or you have to get the money to be able to buy the food and water. So what do you have to do? Where does money come from? Work. Work. I, I thought you'd say my parents. Okay. <laughs> money comes from doing a favor, giving someone, someone that is more important to them than the money itself. Work. Okay, so yeah, that's good. It comes from giving somebody something that's more important to them than the money they give you. I would never call that a favor, although they benefit from it, because what happens to you? You benefit from it? You also benefit from it. So money comes from producing something, something that is of value to other people or to yourself, because you could eat, you could produce the food for yourself. So the only way to make money, the only way to provide for yourself, the only way to feed yourself and buy the material goods that are necessary for your life is to be productive. So reason, I would say, is number one in terms of our values. But second, is to be productive. It's to actually work out there in reality and make stuff. So building, making, producing, creating, that is what allows us to have the material things that make it possible for us to live. 
And what happens? What do you think you feel inside? If you produce and if you make and if you take care of your life and you take care of the people you love and you feed them and you, you know, provide them with a nice house and with nice clothes, what do you feel about yourself? What's that? Yeah, you feel satisfaction. Tired. Tired. Tired? Like exhausted. Like, oh my gosh. No, no. I mean, yes, maybe at 11 o'clock at night, but why would you feel tired during the day? You're doing something, hopefully, that you love, that you enjoy, that produces great benefits, that produces product for you and for the people you love. Everybody gets an iPhone, everybody has a nice roof above their head, everybody's living a good life. I don't feel tired that often. I mean, in the morning and late at night, but when you do something you enjoy doing, and you're producing and you're creating, you feel the opposite of tired, you feel energized. So, being productive. Now, see, you feel satisfaction. What else do you feel? What's another word for satisfaction? Happiness. You feel happy. I'd say you feel proud. I did it. I did it. I'm, I'm worthy of living on this earth. I can provide for myself. I can provide for the people I love. I can provide, I can make something in this world. I would call that also self-esteem. Right? Self-esteem is really, really important. Now think about Bernie Madoff again. You remember the pyramid scheme guy? Do you think he felt proud? No. You think he felt, maybe at first, do you think he felt self-esteem? I don't think so, because what is he depending on? What, is, what are crooks, thieves? Fraudsters. I'm not going to get into politics, but you know, I'm going to say Lula, but you know. Um, what are they, what are they, what, where is they, how are they taking care of themselves and their families? By stealing, which means they are admitting to themselves that they cannot take care of themselves, that they cannot produce for their family. And therefore, they have to steal what other people produce. What thieves are is dependent on other people. They're dependent on the producers. They're dependent on people that have money. They're dependent on people that can take care of themselves. They know deep down inside them that they cannot produce, that they cannot create, that all they can do is use muscle, which is the opposite of using your mind in order to survive. So they have no self-esteem. It's why people who lie, steal, and cheat are almost always unhappy. It's not just about being caught. It's not just about not having friends, but it's knowing inside that they cannot take care of themselves, that they're completely dependent on other people, and that they depend not on what's human, which is the mind, but on what's animalistic, if you will, within us, which is force, which is muscle. Right. So to be self-interested, you have to be rational, you have to be productive, you have to be honest. Anything else? How should you treat other people? Respectfully, you should you repeat everybody respectfully? Yeah. Yes. yeah? No. Even the lying, cheating, stealing, no. nasty person? According to the Bible, yes. <laughs> According to what? Bible. The Bible. Let's put the Bible we said. We're putting the Bible and religion aside. Right? How should you treat people? I mean, in your life, how do you treat people? All of them? Always? Depending on the person. Yeah. Yeah. I treat them like how they treat me. You treat them how they treat you. Intense. She is intense. Huh? <laughs> so it depends on the person. Depends how they treat you. I would say the right way to treat people, we have a concept for that. It's called justice or fairness. We should be fair to people. If people are good people, People are just uh, 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 decent people, people are the kind of people, you know, 
that are, that, are, that are taking care of themselves, that are, that are rational, that are productive, that are good, basically, then you treat them well. The people are no good. The people are Bernie Madoff. What do we do with Bernie Madoff? Do we treat him well? No. No, we put him in jail. It's called justice. So again, you use your mind. The standard is your life to treat people the way they deserve to be treated. We all deserve, based on our actions, certain we deserve respect or we deserve disrespect. So, when I read Atlas Shrugged, what it taught me was how to live for myself, which meant being rational, being productive, being honest, treating people with justice, being proud of my achievements, trying to achieve things, trying to you know make my world the best world that it could be, and uh, it was really different than everything else I was being taught. Now, are other people important if you want to live just for yourself? No. Yes. no? Yes. I, I should live on a desert island somewhere. Why are other people important if I want to live just for myself? <laughs> Read production. That's good. All right, how about we put politics we're not going to talk about and sex we're not going to talk about. So yes, reproduction is important. You need other people to reproduce, at least uh, so far. Science hasn't got to the point where we can do it ourselves, right? What else do we need other people for? Trade. We need to trade. Other people's production is incredibly valuable to ourselves. I said I don't know how to make clothes. I can talk. I get paid to talk. I take that money and I go and buy somebody else's productive ability in making clothes or in making iPhones. So trade is crucial. We cannot live well without the ability to trade with other people. And again, who loses when you trade? No, no. no one. It's win-win. I paid, I guess, $600 for this iPhone. You know, when I go back to the US, maybe I'll buy the iPhone 10, which is $1,000, a lot of money. But how much is this worth to me if I paid $600 for it? More than $600. More than $600. Now, when I actually think about how much this is worth to me, it's like tens of thousands of dollars. It's changed my life, right? I can, I can travel all over the world and FaceTime with my family. I can communicate with everybody everywhere. I can be on top of the news 24 hours a day everywhere in the world. This is worth tens of thousands of dollars to me personally. Now, don't tell Apple because I don't want them to raise my price. But I don't know where my life would be without this. So I want to be in a society with a group of people who are producing and creating beautiful, really good things because I can't produce them. One of the beauties of living in a world is kind of the division of labor that we all specialize. And then we can all produce. So if you're self-interested, the last thing you want to do is live on a desert island. Okay, so trade and reproduction, what else are other people good for? Relationship. Yeah, relationship, friendship, love. Hopefully you connect the love with reproduction and don't keep them separate. Um, other human beings provide us with incredible value through friendship and love, through relationships, through the fun of being engaged with other people. So if you're self-interested, you don't want to live alone. You want to have friends. You want to have loving relationships. You want to be trading with people. So you want a society. But what kind of society is optimal if you're self-interested? It's where everybody is what? Fair. It's what? Fair. Fair. Fair is good. Depends on what you mean by fair, of course. Right? <laughs> where they're just, where they're fair, where people get what they deserve but also where other people are doing what with their own life? They're taking care of themselves. The ideal society is one in which, I would argue, we're all self-interested, rationally self-interested. We're all producing for ourselves. We we'll all want to trade. Nobody wants to steal, nobody wants to lie, nobody wants to cheat. 
Because we all want to be proud of our own lives and we want to all live lives that are full and complete and whole. And as a consequence, we want to live in a society where people are self-interested. Really, rationally, properly self-interested. Now, what kind of society allows people to be self-interested? What's that? Fairness. Fairness, which means what? Which means what? Fairness is a great word, but means what? What's that? Honesty. Honesty. Okay. Equal opportunities. Equal opportunities. Does equal opportunities exist? No. Can equal opportunities exist? Yes. How can equal opportunities exist? Somebody tell me how you can create equal opportunities. But not giving anyone special treatment. What's that? But not giving anyone special treatment. Okay, by not giving anyone special treatment, you get but you get equal opportunities if you don't give anybody special treatment. No. It's not equal outcomes. Yeah, but even opportunities, right? So I, I, I work really hard. Part of my motivation to make money is to provide my kids with the best opportunities I can provide them. Some parents don't. Are my kids going to have exactly the same opportunities as other, as other kids? No. 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 no, but you have access to the same opportunities. You're just making the choice not to give them the, the best. But I'm making a choice for my kids. My kids, like your parents, made choices about you. So the kids are not at fault. It's not that the kids are not taking advantage of the opportunity. It's the parents are providing some kids with more opportunities than other kids. And I think that's inevitable. There's no way to get around that. There's no way. So I'm always suspicious of something that you can't actually do. It's like a utopian ideal. And I think equal opportunities is one of those things. So my view is what you want is to maximize opportunities because you can never equalize them. There's no such thing as equal opportunities. For example, we're born with different genes. Some of us are born smart and some are born with less smart, right? Do we have the same opportunities? No. Some of us have loving parents and some of us don't have loving parents or, or parents that care. It's just a reality. Sad, but it's a reality. They don't have equal opportunities. There's no way to make them equal. So I view is what you want is to create a society in which we maximize opportunities. So whatever station in life, whatever circumstance in life you're born into, you have the most opportunities one could imagine, given where you are. And to maximize opportunities, what you need is freedom. What you need is freedom to use your mind, to be productive, to go out there into the world and make the most of your life. And you need freedom for other people to do the same so they can build an iPhone and build and create stuff and make stuff and produce stuff so that we're all better off because trade is a win-win relationship. So I believe you maximize opportunities by maximizing freedom. And people who are self-interested want a maximum of freedom. They want to be left alone. Because what is the enemy, what do you think the enemy of reason is? What's the enemy of rational thought? What's the one thing that if you're rational and if, you're, if you want to pursue your reason, that really can stop you? That really can, 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 what's that? Religion. <laughs> See, I can't escape this, right? No, you can overcome religion. Yeah. I say feelings. Feelings or emotions, right? But even emotions, where do emotions come from? Instance. Can you change your emotions? Yes. Do you have control over your emotions? No. Long term, in the moment you don't have any control over your emotions. But over time, do you think you have control over your emotions? Yes. Do you ever change your emotions because you change your ideas? Yes. yes. You fall in love with somebody and they cheat on you. Do your emotions change? Yes. Yeah. So emotions are consequences of conclusions we come about. Don't make it personal. <laughs> I see all kinds of conflicts already. <laughs> Emotions are consequences of conclusions we've already come to. If we change our conclusions, we can change our emotions. Yeah. Uh, what about an individual with an with a, with a opposing, with, with opposing frame of mind that you have? So an opposing frame of mind, if he leaves me alone, that's not a problem. 
When does it become a problem? If he doesn't leave you alone. If he doesn't leave you alone. So the thing, the enemy of reason, the enemy of thinking, the enemy of producing is force. If I put a gun against your head, and you're going to do what I tell you to do, not what you think. If I put against your, a gun against your head and say, you can't go over there. You can't do agriculture. You can only do, I don't know, hunting. You can't make that product. You can only make that product. I'm cutting off whole pieces of your choices. The enemy of reason, the enemy of rationality is force. The one thing we want in a civilized society to eliminate, to get rid of, is coercion and force and authorities. Think about authority, right? Think about Galileo. Galileo makes this unbelievable discovery that the earth goes around the sun, not the sun goes around the earth. And what happens to it? No, he wasn't burnt. He got lucky. He got put under house arrest. He got a trial. He was found guilty of offending the authorities. One of the real important parts about freedom of speech is that the only way to have freedom of speech is to allow some people to offend us. Because the fact is, the only way to discover truth is to allow people to offend us. Because the fact is that every new truth is offensive. Galileo was offensive to the Catholic Church. Newton, when discovering the laws of motion, was offensive to all the people who had other theories. So, truth requires that we be open-minded and that we let people say, even when they say stupid things, even when they say offensive things, that's the crucial part about free speech. Okay, so self-interested means being rational, living by reason, it means being productive, it means being honest, having pride in yourself, treating people with justice the way they deserve, and to make that a reality, we need to live in a free society that maximizes opportunities, that eliminates, outlaws the use of force and coercion and authority from human life. So we are in a free society where the one thing they do, the government does, is extract force from society, where we don't have to worry about violence. You know, one of the things that is really sad about Brazil is you've got a massive government that has huge amounts of money, and the one thing they're supposed to do, protect you from crime, they don't. They do a lot of other things, but the one thing they don't do is protect you from criminals, which is what they should do. It's one of the first things you should fix. You know, the first thing of civilization is, you know, peace and, uh, and uh, safety. All right, so uh, any, I don't know how we're doing on time. <coughs> we're out of time. Time. A question or two, and then uh, anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, you said that other humans are important for having relationships and having trade, yeah. but you also mentioned that it's really important to be honest with yourself and also freedom of speech. Yeah. But some th some things that happen a lot of times when you have freedom of speech and you offend other people, you end up losing your friends. So yeah. how do you find the balance between of that? Well, my view is the balance should always be on the side of what is true. And if you, look, if you if by advocating for the truth you lose friends, then they probably want your friends to begin with. Now, that doesn't mean you say things that are offensive in order to offend yeah. people. That should never be the case. You should only say things that some people find offensive in the search for truth, in trying to figure out what is right and what is wrong. And if some people get offended by you trying to figure out the truth, then that's their problem, it's not yours. And it's sad that you lose friends, but you know, we all lose friends in life. It's not that you have to keep any particular friends. What you need is friendship. And your friends might have to change based on your ideas. Yeah. Uh, however, how would an individual be able to discern objective truth from subjective truth? Exactly. How do you discern between objective truth and subjective truth? Is this a glass? You think it is? 
Anybody think this isn't a glass? You don't think it's a glass? I think that the question is, would anybody put money against this idea? Yeah, would anybody put money against the idea that this is glass? Would you put your life against this idea? Or if you're crossing the street, anybody want to bet against that car is a really car and it's going to hit you when it comes? No, there is objective truth. There is objective truth. It's not always easy, like here, it's easy. Why is it easy? Because we can see it, and we have experience with glasses, and we don't know. It could be that I'm a magician, not a mystical magician, but like a magician on the stage. And this is really something else, but it just looks like a glass, and I'm projecting something, and it's complicated. So we make mistakes in life. But there is such a thing as objective truth. And finding objective truth is hard. It's not easy to know what is right. It's not easy to know what is true. It's one of the reasons why we have to be willing to let people speak, why we're willing to let people say things that sometimes are offensive. Because what is true and what is not true is not easy to figure out. And sometimes people are going through discovery process that might be offensive. But it's important to let them go through it so that discovery can happen. So my view is the most important thing you can do in life is to figure out what, it, what is objectively true. The most important thing you can do in life is to use your mind to evaluate the facts of reality to know what is true and what is not. Because we are told, particularly by our leaders, lots of stuff that's not true, that's not objectively true. It's our responsibility as individuals and we're told this by our leaders, by sometimes our teachers, sometimes our professors, sometimes the authorities, the people in our lives who are authorities. Stuff that is not true. But your responsibility is your life. So your responsibility is to discover what is real reality. What are the facts? What is truth? And that's hard. But that's what living is all about. It's about engaging your mind Focusing on what's real and what is, and, and ignoring what is not. Focusing on facts and ignoring what is not. And sometimes controlling your own feelings because your feelings want to go in one direction and your mind wants to go in another. Slow down. Don't just jump with your feelings. Think it through. It's about at the end of the day thinking, which relies on objective reality, which relies on facts, which is not easy but it's what leads to success in life. All right, thank you all.